Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for uh, spending your, your day with us. Um, just going to quickly start us off. It, was, it all kind of started with a question with, why would we ever build a distributed computing platform in Node? So let's we'll start here with a little bit who, all, who I am. My name is Gord Tanner. I'm on Twitter at, at Gord Tanner. I am the co-founder and CTO out at uh, BitHound. So uh, BitHound is a small startup. We're pretty new, about a year. Uh, founding team was founded by uh, Dan Silvestri, PJ Lowe, and myself. Um, we're from Kitchener, Ontario, and up in Canada, just a little bit west of Toronto. Uh, our office is actually in an old restored house in the uh, downtown core, which, which is uh, pretty nice for uh, Canada when we have our about three months of summer, we can sit on a porch and work. Um, but a little bit of a backstory about what BitHound does. Um, the whole, whole premise of what we're doing is, as developers, we generate a lot of data just with doing our jobs. As we work, we generate code. There's diffs we create. There's code we write. There's code we delete. There's tests we write. There's tests we run. There's issues we open and close and bugs we open and close. There's just an inherent wealth of data that is generated as we work on software projects. And what, we wanted, what we're doing at BitHound, our goal is to take all this data and to try to use it to determine an overall quality or health score, to give kind of a, a baseline metric to determine how, how projects are working. Um, but, but with that is there's an inherent problem. So the, to process this data, there's a lot of it, and it takes time. So imagine running JS Hint on a thousand commits in your project, or doing another static code analysis, or looking at history, or just viewing the number of lines in a file. Everything we want to do inherently is a problem of time, and there's a lot we want to look at. So the, from the very start of BitHound, as we were kind of throwing our ideas of what we actually wanted to make, we knew that this was going to be a concurrent problem. This wasn't something that we'd be able to do without really using the concept of concurrency. So quick definition, this is actually just from Wikipedia, concurrency. The whole concept of concurrency is just a, the simple act of having computations that are executing simultaneously. And those computations or, or functions or code that's running have the potential to interact with each other. So with that being said, the question I first get asked is, why JavaScript? Of, of all the languages that are out there, why would we pick JavaScript? There's Go, there's Ruby, there's C Sharp, there's Python, there's Haskell. There are a lot of languages out there that have much richer concurrency primitives built into into the languages. So with any real tech story, any real tech decision, it's, there's a little bit of backstory to kind of give you where, why we made this decision. So the start, um, there was a company called Tiny Hippos, which um, some of the employees were Dan Silvestri, PJ Lowe, and Gord Tanner, amongst a few others. Um, we were a small consulting shop doing um, basically hybrid apps. So using those like phone gaps and using like Jill and Wack, and building, building these apps for clients. But there's, there's a problem we noticed, and we ended up writing tools internally that became our product at Tiny Hippos called Ripple, um, which was, all it really was was a mobile phone emulator that ran in Chrome as an extension. Um, pretty cool, we had a lot of fun, sold, sold it to BlackBerry, but the whole concept was the entire code base was JavaScript. If any of you have written a Chrome extension, you know that there's no back, your backing store, backing code is JavaScript. So we just had a lot of experience dealing early on with JavaScript as in a larger product. So with that being said, we had a lot of core competency in, in our team with using JavaScript. We've been using Git for a while. So the whole concept of, pardon the pun, eating your own dog food, um, we decided that the first language we're going to target with BitHound would be JavaScript and analyzing Git repositories. And what better place to analyze is your own code base. So day one, without even thinking about, is this the right choice, we chose JavaScript. So to go back to that concept of concurrency, highlight a couple other words here. Um, concept of concurrency is that if code can run on 
multiple cores, on time-shared threads on the same core, or in physically separated processors or physically separated machines. And there's a couple ways of handling concurrency in, in computer science. So the more traditional way um, that people kind of think of like concurrency, think of threading, they think of sh this concept of shared memory. So the, one way to kind of add, share this information between is to uh, alter like contents of a, something in a known state in your memory. So you have like a shared memory location, you'll alter the state of that, and, and usually with some form of locking, you will signal other threads that they, ha they can run in and read or, or mutate that state. So the concept of thread safety or using things such as mutexes or semaphores or monitors, um, it's a pretty robust and expressive form of concurrency and handling of having multiple processes talk to each other and work together. But is anyone who has ever spent a weekend trying to uh, figure out what caused your service to deadlock is inherently complicated. It is inherently hard to try to reason about all the potential timing interactions between threads, between memory accesses, between processes. So another form of concurrency is message passing. And the concept of is exchanging messages, which was kind of brought to us by Scala, Erlang, and actually JavaScript, um, where you can asynchronously or synchronously pass these messages around. And the act of passing the message is sending the data between processes or threads. Um, so if I go to the actual um, definition of, like, say, Node.js is our platform, um, on Node.js, they kind of describe what Node is by saying that it's, built, it's for building scalable network applications that are data intensive and run across distributed devices, which are all kind of big key points for us and we're knowing we need to build a distributed computing platform. And what's Node's big claim to fame is its concept of asynchronous I.O. So we all know there's, there's an inherent cost in I.O. And if you're ever to like time slice what your processes are actually doing, I.O. usually ends up eating up a lot of that time. So just reading from RAM, reading from CPU, going to the disk, to the network, there's an inherent cost of dealing with I.O. So the concept of asynchronous I.O. in Node um, was the idea that having your event loop and just sending off messages back to a backing end thread pool, having those messages kind of come back into your event queue and be fed back into your event loop. And Node, Node didn't really invent this, but it use what JavaScript was designed for, because JavaScript was written first for the browser. And when, uh, probably when they uh, were proposing it, like every browser writer said, you want user code to get in my rendering pipeline, hence why we have the invented DOM, why we have like, the concept of one thread running, but handling messages from mouse move or hover or window ready. We were kind of working with this in the web for a long time, and, and Node kind of just used that same concept of what JavaScript already had, but bringing it into the concept of I.O. So this doesn't come without controversy. Um, having one thread, having one, one kind of process sitting there, pulling stuff off a queue, interacting with it, running your code, sending a message off, you can block. And that's where the concept of, like I think there was, this was a pretty, pretty interesting post where they were talking about where you, you can block the event loop just by doing heavy CPU intensive work. And it's a bad thing. It causes your request per second to go down if you write things. And a lot of people were kind of throwing around um, different ways of doing it. But there is an inherent beauty actually in, in this uh, limitation. So bear with me for a second. Trying to move a window over there, but that's not working. Is it the other way? No. Oh, I give up. Anyway, the, the concept of 
having one thread is, is good because a lot of that weird concurrency mumbo jumbo with our like kind of preamble you have to deal with in other languages disappears. So the whole concept is, is am I, am I going to sit up here and kind of create another distributed framework? If you actually go to NPM right now, type in the keyword distributed, you'll get about 2,000 results of distributed frameworks um, averaging around version 0.0.1. Uh, might have two or three commits three years ago. Um, the short answer is no. No, I'm not going to develop yet another uh, distributed framework for y'all to use. It's a very personal choice. Um, choose the tools that work for you, the network design that works for you. Um, just to make things easier, I open sourced the section of code we use at Bithound. Uh, you can get it on our GitHub, bithoundfarm.bithound.io. Um, just as an example, uh, use it at your own risk. I might clean it up later. But I'm just going to give you the story of how we built our backing and tools. So starting with, we um, working at another startup uh, called Thalmic. I was using something called Zero MQ. Um, and it's a really beautiful uh, messaging library. So it's basically, Zero MQ looks like an embeddable networking library, but acts like a concurrency framework. So we've all worked with sockets in the past. We've used web sockets, we've used TCP sockets. We know the concepts of writing and reading to sockets. And that's exactly how you work with a zero MQ socket. It's just there's an extra kind of goodness that's hidden inside of it. So the concept of what we take a zero MQ socket is that they carry atomic messages across transparent transports. So rather than having a instantiating a socket and saying, oh, that's going to go over TCP. You can interchange the, through the construction of these sockets to make them go in-process messaging or inter-process via shared memory um, through TCP or, th or even multicast, like, sp like spamming your entire subnet with the same message. But that's all transparent. As far as you're concerned, you're reading and writing to a socket. Um, also, the Something else that's kind of cool with these sockets is that you can connect them end to end with concurrency style patterns. So you can do stuff like request reply. So I can have one socket that sends out a request and have five listeners to that, which will round robin reply to it. Or I can have five people that make requests on one that will reply. And we're all familiar with the standard request reply. But there's also ideas such as publish, subscribe, so you can do eventing. So publish an event, subscribe to events. Um, task distribution, so I mentioned round robin. Um, but, oh, I went a couple slides. But you can kind of like connect them together. So with that being said, I'll jiggle that. Um, the concept of tasks kind of comes to play. I'll just do that one more time. Um, so when I say tasks, all I want you to do is think of atomic chunks of work in your app. So those kind of bigger pieces of information that you can kind of share, that you can go, I can run this concurrency. Once you kind of like think about all those, the problem is, is you're probably wrong. Um, the whole idea is to basically try to get the idea to understand your project um, assess your actual application's needs, and then only then start to define your tasks. And also, as you're doing this, build in a way that you can adapt. So the idea is you're, you want to be able to change. You want to be able to, change, to um, adapt to how you are coding. So with that being said, once we kind of had that um, idea around, oh god, now my computer's frozen. Um, we had the idea of roles. So I'm just going to try one quick display thing. OK, so to give you an idea, um, you're, we kind of started off, we said we had roles that we kind of had an idea. We had this master and slave relationship where a master would be, for example, something like our web server. Its job is to start, start jobs, to kind of break down the work, and to listen to results. And the, the master process the idea was it would just send off to uh, the slave processes, which would just connect. And their, their only job is to really process these messages. So 
the whole concept that a master could send out, hey, can you do this thing for me? And some slave process out there would pick it up, process it, and say, yeah, sure, here you go, and send it back to us. The idea is that the master doesn't know how many slaves are out there. Uh, through Zerum, the magic of Zerum Q sockets, we don't even have to have any slaves out there. It'll just The message will sit in a queue waiting until a slave is connected and rejoins and sends it to it. Um, but with that being said, is there... There are, like, say we had a bunch of things to do. We had the ability to send a list of things or send an array of messages and have those, those work in parallel. So if we send a list of 10, we could have 10 concurrent slave processes pick up and send their information back. Um, and we just waited on, on the things. So what, what quickly, as we started developing with this and it was working, we, had, we hit a problem where we would have a job, so our web server was our master typically, and we'd say, for example, in our case, we wanted to process a repository, and the first thing we need to do is get a list of commits. So we would have our, like, we didn't want our web server sitting there cloning a Git repository, listing all the commits, building up messages, and sending them off, and then waiting and going, okay, we have 50 messages back and, and working with it. So the idea was we just wanted to send out a process, process a commit, or process a repo message, and that, whatever slave process happened to pick that up, they would clone a repo, build up a list, and go, here are all the commits. And rather than sending that back to the master to do some over big orchestration, just have the slave kind of throw out into the world, here's some commit messages, and wait to come back for those to come back, and then return back to the original person who wanted to process this message. So that kind of had some existential things where we're trying to figure out what's the difference between our master and our slave processes at this point. Because we're having, essentially we're having slave processes working and elevating themselves to almost a master. So the, the key was is there, there was no difference. There was, at the end of the day, what we ended up with was having just a collection of workers. Um, so workers are just generic processes out there that would that sit there, listen to jobs. We have the concept of there are some workers that just want to tell people to do things and don't actually want to do any of the work. I'm sure we can all think of examples of that, such as our web server or, I don't know, a manager of some sort. Um, but the whole concept of workers across, we can spin them up as many as we want, and the more we add and the more they join, they just work together. So this is where my slides get interesting. So we made a module called Farm. It's open source, you can check it on Bithound GitHub if you have the, the interwebs. Um, so we kind of broke it down into these kind of concurrency primitives of how we wanted to work with our data. So the first thing was that standard kind of pub, I have a message and I want someone to do it, I don't care who. So they'll send, it's basically the farm.jobs.send and just give it an object literal and, and a callback. And job is sent out into the compute farm. Somewhere, somehow, a process will pick it up and they call a callback and send it back. Um, and then we also had the idea of dist distribute because we'll have a list of tasks. And it's a little bit of difference of saying, like, I have a list of things that I don't care the order that they're processed in versus I have a single job I want you to do. So we had a separate method called jobs.distribute, which we send it a task, and we have a function at the end that just gives us the result of all of those tasks. Something that was actually really cool was we, um, because ZeroMQ added the publish subscribe type of sockets, we were able to add a, a publish sub. So we can go farm.events.publish, farm.events.subscribe. And this was actually really cool. We just added it in because we could, but because we ended up with a lot of processes out there, having a global pub sub that works exactly like event emitter that you're used to in Node was actually really powerful. And we started routing really neat things through there, just kind of maintenance tasks, saying clean up this directory or um, sending out stats. So all of our metrics of like overall health of our cluster are sent via pub sub events. Um, so if anything, if look, at the, look at the repo just for having that. If you have any clustered processes and you kind of want to have some way to send events back and forth or consume events or just have a generic a overall monitor, you can do some pretty cool things. And, uh, oh, goodness. So 
So there we are. And then lastly, the kind of opt-in concept of worker. Um, all we have, all we do is you do farm.worker pass uh, a callback, and that callback just takes a task object, and, and you g we give you a callback that you call with error result. You, um, the whole concept of a worker, the worker doesn't need to care if this job was sent to it via a sp explicit send or if it was distributed amongst a batch. All the worker cares about is there's a task it has to do, an object it needs to work on, and a callback that it can call when it's done. So, so I want to tell you a little bit about launch day. Um, so we built this out. We had a closed launch of like 50 to 100 people, and and it didn't go that well. It, we learned a lot, um, and we, one of the core things we learned was what works on one machine well doesn't really work as well when you're running it on 200 machines. So our developer environment typically around that time was uh, OS X. We had our web app running on our server. We had a broker process kind of running there, and we started up worker processes for every core we had on our laptop, or even doubling up some. But it was all contained on our laptop. But, but in production, um, we had hundreds of machines that didn't talk to each other really well. We had our collection of web apps. We had a couple brokers. And we had hundreds of machines. There, some are physically separated from each other. Some are running in virtual machines. But hundreds, imagine hundreds of machines that are not talking to each other, 100 machines that all tried to clone a repo at the same time. And if you ever want to get rate limited by GitHub, that's a good way to do it. Um, and because as we were developing this on one machine, all of our sharing assumptions were wrong. We were just kind of working this out and realizing that like, someone could get a clone repo task, but they're not necessarily guaranteed to ever get a commit task. Or someone who got a commit task wasn't one that got a clone repo task, because you scaled out. So we, we realized quickly that we needed to, if we're going to develop in a distributed environment, we should develop in a distributed environment. So we use a tool called Vagrant. It's a whole other talk um, that I'll, I'll, I can talk later over beers if you want to talk about Vagrant. But Vagrant just allows you to have kind of disposable VMs. And it allows you to kind of fire up VMs and clo clone them real quickly. And this allowed us to basically build a miniature prod with a single script. So we can kind of do Vagrant up. And it provisions three, four VMs for us set up in a production-like environment. And the beauty of this was is it ended up using the exact same shell scripts and configuration that we used in production. So as we would fire up a new uh, physical machine or a new VM to run in production, it's using the same scripts as if I'm firing up a VM for development. Um, and it really, really helped us. And it really allowed us to test our production scripts, test our development scripts, and really got our developers working exactly like how it would in production. So those things you kind of forget as you're working, like, oh, this is going to run across a bunch of machines, it allows you to like physically experience that. And something I learned from my DevOps guy um, that was a quote that I kind of um, got this, was the concept of pets or cattle. Um, and, he, and he would refer to us as, um, you have like your machine, you have your laptop, and you can kind of say it's your pet. We all love our laptops, put stickers on them, we name them cool things, we have all our bookmarks and our favorite stuff. But our VMs or our production environments are named like Northwest Server 002-Blade Enclosure 1. And the whole concept of the, of the VMs or the production environments is that I don't really care if it breaks, I'll get another one. Like, you all have worked in Amazon Web Services. You just spin up a new instance if it starts behaving. And we actually use that kind of pets or cattle philosophy overall in our architecture that everything from our services, our computers, our jobs, the whole concept, there's an error, destroy the environment, build it up again, and have everything just kind of retry again. Because failure is always an option. You should expect things to, to fail. If something fails, Try it again. Schedule it to run later. Uh, if it keeps failing, you can look into it. Uh, it was beautiful as someone who was doing DevOps kind of part time. A developer came up and said, "Yeah, it stopped like working on my laptop." I can say, "Destroy your VMs and recreate them." Does it still work? Does it still break? No, it works now. Okay, I don't care. Or if there was a an instance somewhere out there, some Amazon instance is kind of misbehaving. 
it like it's taking a little longer or it airs out every once in a while, destroy it, recreate it, start again. And the whole concept of they're cattle, they're just they're useful chunks of stuff. So with that being said, as we're building this up, we ended up building almost like this giant Rube Goldberg machine that is using kind of the Unix philosophy of uh, we built, developed a series of tools that could be chained together and run atomically. So rather than having this giant start orchestration, we had a bunch of surgical tools we could run where we're like, like pick, them up, pick jobs up halfway through or try to retry this one section or spin up a bunch more processes to process this extra thing that was feeling a little slow. And once we had this Rube Goldberg machine, something that really was interesting was that we realized that we're, we were part of this overall machine. We were the one. We were a cog in the wheel so that like, if a job kind of failed, you want to be able to get your tendrils in there to um, restart it, to tweak things, to like really allow yourself to embrace failure, to embrace that having a lot of code running over a lot of machines and a lot of latent networks, um, you want to be able to reach in and push things along. Um, so, so why Node? At the end of the day, why Node? Why JavaScript? Um, and we actually found a few kind of wins with it. it was the, the async I.O., the concept of async I.O., and the kind of simple concurrency primitives of there is no concurrency primitives, everything's just events, really helped us. We didn't have to worry about those really complicated re-entrant code or state, or we just kind of coded around the idea that we have one thread. A process will only be doing one thing at a time. Um, also, it was an amazing language to glue a wide array of tools and services together. So it has almost felt like a little pearl or a little, like, yeah, shell-like, where we're able to read in from standard in, write the standard out, inter interact with shell. There's a section of a code that feels a little slow running in JavaScript. Let's just pipe it down to, uh, to a cat command and pipe it to awk, which is really good at stream processing. But it gave us a really good um, glue tool that allowed us overall with all the architecture of like message passing and concurrency to really shell down and do something in a native component or in a shell or a bash script. Um, so, basically, lastly, that's about it. Just thanks for uh, bearing with uh, my technology. Um, questions, probably not the best. You're probably going to ask a question and say, cloud, I'll hear but. Um, my hearing's really bad. If you have a question, um, try to find me after. I'm totally willing to work. I brought some t-shirts I can probably hand out. But uh, I'll let you all go home or listen to the closing remarks. Cheers. <laughs>